see you this morning. Thrilled to see you this morning. Hey, thrilled to see you this morning. Welcome to the service this morning. Alfred's going to be playing for us. Let's pray for him as he plays. Pray for the worship service as we're getting ready.
But I want to invite you to join us with the, the Apostle John in the last chapter of the Bible in Revelation as he finds himself with a vision in a throne room, the living creatures around him. And it says this, it says, And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within, and day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Holy, holy, holy. Let's stand as we sing. Who is worthy of worship, isn't he? He's the one who is worthy. Holy, holy, holy. We will glorify him. Let's greet one another in the Lord. Good morning and welcome to worship. We have a special message 
uh, via video that we want to show you this morning. So if you'll turn your attention to the screen. First Baptist Burleson, it is Joel and Luke here with For King and Country. Yes, and uh, first of all, giving a shout out to yes. our brothers, father-in-law. Let's go, meet him. Let's go. We're man. But that's not what we're here to talk about. <laughs> we're here to talk about, speaking of family, uh, a film that's very close to Luke's and my heart. Uh, it's a film about miracles and mums and music. It's a 90s film. It's a true story. It's ultimately the story of our parents coming to Australia to the United States and all of the Tri troubles and triumphs that they face along the way and you're invited to be our unsung ambassadors in getting the word out the film comes out on april the 26th it just so happens to be our parents 49th wedding anniversary and we've dubbed this up family day so we've got mother's day you've got father's day we need a good family day so we hope to see you in the cinemas uh keep early in line and until then see you down the road on my last tour back home, I lost a lot of money. A life of pages, to be How can we say goodbye to everything that we know and love? This is my last chance. I want to do something that matters. However you guys feel about being here, we need to pray for everything that we need. But this be gone is harder than but look around you, your family, your faith. That's what makes you rich in life. Welcome to Nashville, y'all. I don't know what tomorrow's gonna bring. This is our exciting adventure together. Fire! You have been given a beautiful voice. She's the special one, David. The trick is getting other folks to see it. Does anybody really care what a 16-year-old girl thinks about God? I'm trying to protect her, and it will never be enough! It's gonna be dangerous and scary. It's gonna be so hard that you wanna go back. And giving in, it's not an option. We've gotta fight our way forward. Your family, they're not in the way. They are the way. It takes a lot to live out your dream. Hard work and sacrifice. My dream is to be like you. You're my hero, Mum. Are y'all from England? Australia. Australia. I wish I had an accent. Uh, who's gonna tell him he does have an accent, right? Uh, so that is a special opportunity that we have as a church. If you don't know, that's for King and Country. They are not from America, if you couldn't tell. Uh, but that is the story. They, they are a very popular traveling Christian worship band. If you listen to Caleb in particular, you probably hear their songs all the time. Uh, we have a relational connection through Billy Beecham with that family. Uh, and because of that relational connection, we actually have an opportunity and an invite from King and Country themselves to pre-screen the new movie Unsung which is the story of their family, moving from Australia to the States. From everything I've heard, it's, it's an incredible movie. Uh, and we have 100 tickets for free uh, that'll be available in the atrium and in the comments today. After those 100 tickets are gone, we do have the opportunity for more people to jump on board. It will be $5 a person. And I know you're wondering, what is the date? Uh, this pre-screening, private screening, will happen next Sunday at 6.30 p.m at Premier Theaters. So, April 21st, next Sunday, 6.30 p.m., we wanna invite you uh, as a church to come be a part of that special evening and special opportunity as we get to pre-screen this movie uh, that is coming out the following weekend. If it's your first time here, welcome to worship. Uh, we are First Baptist Burleson. We're all about two things, that is pursuing Christ and loving people, and you will see that in the expression of everything that we do. It's our, it's our Desire, if it's your first time here, to connect with you. Uh, so if you have a moment to scan either on the bulletin in front of you or the screen behind me, there's a QR code. If you'll scan that, you can find a connect card. If you'll leave us a little bit of information, we would love to make a record of your visit, but also reach back out this week to see how we can serve you further, how we can help you get further connected into the life of our church. Uh, if you came prepared to give today, anyone in the room, 
Uh, you can also do that through that QR code or in boxes at the back of the room. This is a month where we're taking a special offering for the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Uh, and so you can give there as well on top of tithes and offerings. Uh, we have a lot of things going on in the life of our church we want to make sure that you're aware of. Number one, father-daughter dance is coming up. I am a, a girl dad, unashamed, have two little girls. Uh, and so on uh, April 27th, I've already RSVP'd. I will be there with them for a Hawaiian luau-themed night. So very excited for that. Um, one particular need that we have is that that night takes a lot of energy and effort to pull off. So if you're uh, in the room, maybe you're not going to be attending with a daughter or a daughter figure in your life and you want to be a part of that, we're looking for volunteers who can help pull that off. If you would pull one of our pastors aside or go online and volunteer for that, we would be uh, over the moon excited and appreciative for that. We also have Baptism Sunday coming up that next day, April 28th. So if you've never taken the next step in life with Christ and showing the world that you're following Christ and believers' baptism, we want to invite you to be a part of that on April the 28th. And then finally, um, we have an opportunity to be the church here locally. We talk about being on mission locally and globally, a very specific opportunity coming up through the Next Step Women's Center. And it is this, that on May the 12th, we're actually going to host a baby shower for um, women at the Next Step Women's Center. Now, we'll have a representative from the center who we are showering, but we're going to have a drive in the next three weeks, April 28th, May 5th, and May 12th, uh, looking for different items. So um, clothes for babies and toddlers, um, toys for babies and toddlers, diapers, food, all the things. We're inviting you as a church to donate those items. We'll have big boxes every Sunday morning around the church that you can donate those items into. And then we're going to have a shower on May 12th and then bless the Next Step Women's Center as they go into the summer uh, that we get to make an impact here locally in the lives of young women. Uh, and ultimately, hopefully, give them a glimpse of the love of Jesus through that action and be able to invite them into a relationship with him. So we want to challenge you to be a part of that. Uh, as we continue to worship together this morning, can I pray for us? Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you that you have an eye for the least of these. Thank you that you have a plan, God, and that we cannot thwart that plan. You are sovereign, you are holy, and you are in control. Father, I pray as we come before you today that our minds, attention, and our hearts, affection would be holy and fully on you, and that you would receive all the glory and praise that is deserved for the name of Jesus Christ, that is just as creation proclaims his majesty, we do that as well, God. We glorify you. We praise you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's join the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians there when he talks about Jesus is going to come again. Had a real good friend, always ended his email with these words, waiting for the shout, waiting for the shout. Let's sing about the king is coming. Looking around at the world, it's easy to feel defeated or in despair. We aren't the first people to feel this way. Centuries ago, God's people were taken into exile under hostile rulers. Yet God equipped them not only to survive, but to thrive. Through the book of Daniel, God invites us to do the same, shining like stars in the midst of the darkness. Hey, good morning. How's everybody? You smell fantastic. So whatever it is, keep wearing it. Hey, uh, how many got to see the eclipse 
last week. Wasn't that cool? I was really kind of blown away. Uh, I didn't expect it to be that awesome. Uh, but it was wild. When all the street lights started coming on and stuff, that was, that was pretty amazing. Uh, and as a Christ follower, I think it's just kind of that indication of the beauty of our God, uh, the creator of all things. It makes things like that happen. It puts everything in order. Uh, so it was, it was a spiritual moment. And I think it was significant uh, as we consider the fact that we do live in a spiritual world. I hope you realize this. Uh, that is a part of the dimension uh, of who we are and the world that we live in. So I think that was just kind of a, again, just a very vivid glimpse of, of heaven and God and the universe and being in control. Which, again, the timing of it is great because in the chapter of Daniel we're going to study today, It really highlights the fact that there is a heavenly realm, there is a spiritual realm, and there's an earthly realm. And in Daniel chapter 10, we're going to see all those realms collide uh, in a very powerful, powerful moment. So if you have your Bible, I invite you to open to Daniel chapter 10. Uh, As you look there, I want to read a quote to you from A.W. Tozer uh, in in light of our subject matter today. This is what A.W. Tozer wrote. It is not a reassuring thought that the writings of the grief-stricken prophets are often poured over by persons whose interests are curious merely and who never shed one tear for the woes of the world. They have a prying inquisitiveness about the schedule of future events, forgetting apparently that the whole purpose of Bible prophecy is to prepare us morally and spiritually for the time to come. The doctrine of Christ's return has fallen into neglect on the North American continent at least, as far as I can detect, today exercises no power whatever over the rank and file of Bible-believing Christians. So quite an indictment against the American church. Uh, and, and that's kind of been the warning that we talked about in Daniel, that it's fun to talk about the prophecies, it's, it's fun to talk about end times, and uh, though they're still clouded to some degree and what the glimpses that the Bible gives us, but don't miss the lessons that are being taught in the book of Daniel that apply to you and I today getting caught in the weeds, so to, so to speak. Because, again, the whole book of Daniel reminds us God is in control. And we don't have everything figured out. We don't, not everything reveal, is revealed to us is going to happen, but he does prepare us in some ways, which we'll see in Daniel's life today. But the, the overarching message is that God is still sovereign. He is in control, and he does have a plan for all of eternity, and he's invited us to be a part of that plan. So when you look around our world today, again, it's it's hard to sometimes see that God is in control. Uh, With all the riots, with all the crimes, with the school shootings, with with all the stuff we see on the news and everywhere of of how bad things are getting, now we've got uh, wars, obviously, Russia and Ukraine war has been going on for a while, now we have Hamas and Israel and now Iran stepping into this battle. So we, we see all these battles raging over. And the Bible promises there will be wars and rumors of wars to the ends of times. And there are signs. Even though we don't know exactly when Jesus is going to come back, the Bible is clear, there will be signs. Some thought the eclipse was a sign. Uh, I got a text from a, a couple of people uh, in our church after the eclipse that said, hey, I'm still here. Is that a problem? <laughs> right? So... And I respond, I hope not, because I'm here too, right? So, but, I mean, it's, it's cool. It's mysterious. God's word is mysterious. All this stuff is mysterious. But he does give us little insights and glimpses for purposes. Purposes of encouragement, purposes of hope. It does bolster our message to an unbelieving world that, that there is a God who loves them and has a plan. But I wonder how often we as the church, kind of in the A.W.'s uh, indictment, how, how often is our heart broken? over what we see, what other brothers and sisters in other parts of the world experience today, who can't do what we're doing today. Or if they do, it risks their life, or at least imprisonment. Does our heart break over those situations? Does our heart break over those who are suffering today for the faith? Does our heart break for those who have not heard or believed in our God, who is the one true God, who have never experienced the love and the grace of Jesus Christ? Does that Does that motivate us or move us to give to missions and to send missionaries and to be missionaries and to pray? It's it's not the least at all. It's one of the most powerful things we can do is pray. Have you prayed and asked God to save people today? As we gather in worship, 
all over the planet that God would draw people to himself and they would respond in faith and trust to become Christ followers. Is that ever on our heart or our mind? The temptation is we're so caught up in our world and all of our issues, we don't really think about anybody else. Because we do have issues and we do have concerns. But even as I drive through the streets or walk down the streets and I see the, the crowds of people there, does my heart ever break over realizing that there are some there that if they were to die today without Jesus would go to hell for eternity? Does that, does that move me at all to do what I do spiritually in the faith as a Christ follower? Every time we deal with something like this, this subject, I think one of the questions that comes out of this chapter that we will study with Daniel today is this. Do I love God enough to grieve when he is ignored? Do I love God enough to grieve when he is ignored by the very people he created and sent his son to die for? Does that cause grief in my life? That's a sobering question. Because we know the heart of the Father grieves. He desires that no one perish, John 3, 16. His heart is to save us. Well, the Bible tells us he has not returned yet. He is, it's not that he's lazy or forgotten. He's just trying to give more time for more people to believe in him. Again, a demonstration of his grace. Every Sunday we say this is us statement. Uh, This statement for this Sunday is we are not a people who tear each other down. We build each other up. And we say that together out loud. We are not a people who tear each other down. We build each other up. Again, just a reminder of who we are in Christ. Because there are plenty of things in the world trying to tear us down. This needs to be a place where we are built up. Because we do live in a real world. This is what Daniel's going to help us understand to, to some degree. The reality that we live in and the reality of the heavens and the God of the universe. And when they collide, and they collide often, we don't always get to see it. But they are in tandem together, as Daniel will demonstrate. So if you have the Bible again, Daniel chapter 10, I want to read the first nine verses. In the third year of Sirius, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Belshazzar. Its message was true, and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food. No meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. That's a weird thing to say, right? I don't think it's essential oils he's talking about, but he lived in the desert, so keeping your skin hydrated was important, so he chose not to do that. Mm-hmm. So that was painful. I just want to give that disclaimer so you understand. I'm talking about lotion. Verse 4. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river Tigris, I looked up there, and before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Euphaz around his waist. His body was like topaz, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. Those who were with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So I was left alone, gazing at the great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale, and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking, and I listened to him. I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. So Daniel is overwhelmed by this person that shows up as he has this vision from the Lord. So he encounters this man that is so overwhelming that he, all he can do is fall to his face in the ground as if he were dead, as if he were asleep. You can imagine if you were standing there by this river, and all of a sudden this, this man, this image shows up to you. It's, it's terrifying. He is, he is terrified. He is trembling at this experience. But there's some significant things we see in these first nine verses. The fact that he is standing here by this river, by the Tigris River, shows that he has not gone back to Jerusalem. To catch you up from chapter 9 to chapter 10, God's people have been allowed to return back to Jerusalem, back to their homeland, to start rebuilding their city, rebuilding the temple, even though they're still under Uh, another reign of another kingdom but this kingdom is a little more benevolent and so they allow the Jews to go back but Daniel doesn't he's still in in the Babylonian Babylon area why why is he still there well we don't really know for sure but maybe he's too old I mean he's in his 80s 90s at this point and maybe he can't make the journey back Uh, we know that God has already established others to 
rebuild the city. Ezra and Nehemiah have already received the commission to rebuild the, the walls around the city and ultimately to rebuild the temple. Um, I think more what has happened is, is God kept Daniel there in that location because Israel, the Jews, needed a prayer warrior. They knew, needed someone that would stay and engage the heavenly realm asking for protection and provision and guidance as they went to rebuild the, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the Israelites, that understood the strategy of prayer and the importance of prayer. This is why I believe he was left here to do this strategic work. But again, in this passage, we get a cosmic glimpse of the heavenly realm, the spiritual realm, and the earthly realm as they intermingle together on a regular basis, though two of these realms are typically unseen. And so in this passage, we get to see how the kingdom of God functions to some degree beyond our ability to see it with our own eyes. Again, the spiritual world is real. It's also the demonic world is real. There are demons. These are real things, not figures of, figures of people's imagination, not fairy tales used to scare children. These are realities. We know that when Satan fell, many of the angels fell with him, and these are his demons that serve. So there is an evil army seeking to devour you seeking to stop God and what he's doing in the world, seeking to destroy his kingdom all the way back to Daniel, even to our time. Now, again, it's easy to get caught up in all this stuff and become obsessed with it, and that's not my encouragement to you, but there, there are two dangers that can occur. One is we become so obsessed, and we see a devil behind every rock. And there's a demon. It's kind of like Bobby Boucher's mom, right? That's the devil. Right? Everything was the devil. Everything, everything bad happened was football was the devil. Right? So it was the devil. I'm not talking about being like that. We can't, even our own sin, we can't blame on the devil. Now, he tempts us, but we don't have to give in to his temptation through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we can't put that on him. That's ultimately our choice. But so we don't want to blame the devil for everything, but he is real. The other thing is we don't want to ignore what the Bible teaches about the devil. It does give us some insight about this, this spiritual realm that we battle the battle between good and evil, it rages even today. We talk about spiritual warfare. You hear us talk about that subject a lot, or you, you read and study about that. And typically when we talk about spiritual warfare, we're thinking about our own problems and issues, uh, the battles that we fight individually. But there's something much bigger going on, and that's reality for us as we fight as people of Christ against the evil forces of this world. That's why, God, uh, that's why Paul said put on the full armor of God because you're in this battle. But this is a universal battle. This is something that goes on behind the heavenlies that we don't get to see. Thank goodness. It's like Daniel, we would fall to our face in fear and trembling if we were allowed to see what actually goes on. So, again, don't ignore what the Bible says. We're not trying to find every little detail about that goes on, but the scriptures that we do receive, let's be obedient and pay attention to those. Even as Peter says, the devil is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You need to pay attention to that verse because that's reality. Satan wants to mess you up, especially as a child of God. I think you see a lot of these uh, pastors, and we've seen stories over the past several years, terrible stories of what have been coined celebrity pastors, pastors who have great ministries and great churches and big things, and then they fall. I think those are major targets of the enemy because if he can cause one of those pastors or leaders to fall, he's going to take a lot of people with him because they've gained some notoriety, which is a great temptation, and they need more protection and more accountability, but when they fall, many are hurt by that. It's a battle, and the enemy is very strategic in how he fights, and he's very aggressive in how he fights. But this chapter kind of, you guys ever seen the Truman Show? with Jim Carrey, so he's in this make-believe world, basically this, this unreal world, though he thinks it's real. And then one day he finds a door, and he opens up the door, and he goes into what is the real world, and he discovers there's a whole other world. The world he was living in wasn't real, but this is the real world, and what a, what a sobering reality, what a sobering thought. Well, I'm not saying that we live in a bubble, but there's a whole other realm that goes on that we do not see. Again, we have little glimpses into it through Scripture, but there is a war raging this very moment, a battle between good and evil. Now, we know that ultimately Christ wins, and ultimately God is victorious over this. One day Satan will be shut up forever, but for now, 
the war rages, and you and I are engaged in that battle, you must first recognize this truth. This spiritual world that we live in is in a spiritual war, and we are soldiers in this war. We have a part to play in this war, just like Daniel did. And so, again, this is the reality. What we see in Daniel chapter 10 is the divine reality intersecting with the human reality. And it seems like Daniel is kind of caught in between here as he gets this vision. Because it's, it's a horrific vision. And God is strategic in how he relays this vision to Daniel. And it starts with Daniel's mourning. Daniel is mourning over the sins of his people. Remember, he's been in exile, the people of God in exile for 70 years. And God said, after 70 years, after a time, I will destroy the Babylonian kingdom and return you back to Israel. This has not happened yet. And Daniel is praying. He's broken. Last week we talked about it. He put sackcloth and ashes. He began to fast, seeking God. What is missing, Lord, that you have delayed in fulfilling your promise to take the people back? And he realized it's because the people of God had not confessed their sins before a holy God and sought the Lord with all their heart, which is a great reminder for us today that our responsibility as Christians, make sure we are confessing our sin. You're going to sin. It's going to happen every day. Confession needs to be a normal part of our conversation with God. Confessing our sin when the Holy Spirit reveals it to us, that we, it doesn't have any attachment to us anymore. And then seeking the Lord with our whole heart. So it's not just enough to confess our sins. We have to seek the Lord. It's a twofold approach. Are you seeking the Lord or, or simply confessing your sins, but not filling whatever gap or emptiness is there with the Holy Spirit, with the Lord? We are to seek the Lord with all of our heart. Daniel prayed that on behalf of the people, and in this chapter we see that God answered. And God began to bring his people back to Jerusalem, which says a lot about prayer. Now, Daniel is mourning. He's mourning over the sins of his people. We mourn as Christians. Sometimes we mourn inappropriately. Right? Someone in our group, someone on our team got promoted ahead of us, and so rather than rejoice with their blessing and good news, we go into self-pity. Why not me? We start to compare and contrast and analyze why this person, well, they must have cheated or bribed or something, right? That's not an appropriate way to mourn. And there's disproportionate mourning, right? When the Cowboys lose the first round of the playoffs, right? And it wrecks our whole week or our month. We still talk about it, right? Well, we should be used to it by now. It happens every year. <laughs> Or we're in, in concert, we're in the band, and, and we, we play some wrong notes, and it just wrecks our world, and we beat ourselves up. We just want to quit and never pick up an instrument again or never sing in public again. This is disproportionate mourning. But there are things Christians need to mourn about. The Bible says rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. We should mourn over the death of someone who does not know Jesus Christ. That is a reason we can mourn. Like Daniel, we, could, we should also mourn the evil and wickedness that exists in our world. Because that, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but we say these people are victims of the evil one, who we once were too, right? Remember that? Before you asked Christ into your life, you were a victim, you were a servant even of the evil one, an enemy of God. But now through God's grace and the Holy Spirit, you become a child of God. That's the beauty of salvation. Satan hates it when someone follows Jesus. And so he'll do whatever he can to keep them from doing that. So Daniel is appropriately sad as he mourns the sin of his people. And then God shows up in a very powerful way. And again, the strategy of God here is to encourage Daniel to get to remind Daniel of God's faithfulness and God's presence in his life because he's about to reveal something to him that is terrible. He's about to reveal the future to Daniel that is a very dark future for the world. And so he shows up as he's on the side of the river. And so, again, this reminds us that whatever is ahead of us, God is preparing us. Whatever you're about to face tomorrow in your daily life, God is preparing you to face it preparing you to be able to lean on him in maybe a deeper way than ever before 
sometimes we say, I, I wasn't prepared for that. We say, I wasn't prepared for that. But when we look back over our life, sometimes we see God was preparing us in unseen and unnoticed ways that we didn't realize until after the fact. Why? Because God is aware of us. God is present in our lives. And so that should encourage us, even though as we predict the future and what the future is going to be like, and it, it may be bleak, but like Daniel, God showed up in this powerful way. And he describes him. He had a face like lightning. So some of the imagery that we see in this person who shows up with Daniel on the river reflects what we see in Revelation for the description of Jesus Christ. I believe this was Jesus. I believe this was a theophany that, that Jesus showed up. The pre-incarnate Jesus showed up to Daniel in this moment. I don't think this was an angel. I don't think this was some representative of God. I think this was God who showed up to Daniel because the descriptions are so similar of how he's described. And lightning is representative. It, it reminded Daniel of when God showed up in Mount Sinai with the people of Israel as he was leading them to the promised land. And God showed up and he dwelt, dealt with Moses and con conversed with Moses and the Ten Commandments and prepared the people. So there was lightning in, the, in that cloud demonstrating that God is near, that God is present. When you see lightning out in the sky, it should remind us that God is here. He is present. He is in charge, and he is awesome. At Mount Sinai is where the people of God experience the faithfulness and the forgiveness of God. And so we see that demonstrated as this person shows up in Daniel's life. As Daniel mourns the sins of his people, God shows up and reminds him that God has not changed. You go back to Mount Sinai when God showed his forgiveness. It was basically to remind Daniel that his grace is sufficient. The covenant that he made with his people is sufficient to meet the needs of the people, regardless of the difficulty, evil, and darkness they go through. God is sufficient enough for you. Whatever lion's den or fiery furnace you find yourself in, just be reminded in those moments as the heat rises, God is sufficient for you. He is efficient as well. He is present and he is aware. He is enough to meet our needs. God reminds Daniel also that God, the, the adequacy of him. He is adequate to meet everything that you and I experience. He is enough to fight the evil forces that seek to devour us. He is all powerful. He is God. But I think like Daniel, a knowledge of the past, of God working in the past, is necessary for us to live today and to what is coming in the future. Because when you look back over the past and you read scripture and you see it hasn't changed, that encourages us to face whatever battle we're facing right now, as well as the eternal battle. And so this encouragement to Daniel is to seek God's face for the future. The future is unknown, it's still mysterious. We have glimpses we, we don't know fully. But when we read in the word and when we see even what he says will be done. I think another aspect of this part of Daniel, it shows us the significance of our prayers. The prayers of a righteous person availeth much. I hope that we never take prayer lightly. Our prayers are significant. Our prayers move the hand of the creator. Time and time through scripture, we've seen people pray, pour out their hearts over people, and God has listened. Cool thing about this experience with Daniel, God is showing him, we have heard your prayers, and we are responsive. The Lord responds to our prayer. Our prayers, as people of righteousness, are significant. Now, the world, you hear this often, hey, we're asking for prayers and, and thoughts towards this person. Well, if without Christ, the prayers have no meaning. They have no power. It's a nice thought, but there's no power behind it. When you and I pray to the God of the universe, there's power in that prayer. Not because of us, but because the, to the one we pray, who is aware of what's going on. It's amazing to think that when you and I pray, that God uses the resources of the heavens to answer our prayer. Isn't that cool? I mean... All the riches and glory of heaven. He utilizes those things to answer our prayers. Heaven is mobilized at our requests. 
And the devil knows this. The devil understands more than you and I do the power of our prayers. That's why he tries to distract you, distort you, discourage you from praying. Because he knows when you pray, when the people of God pray, something happens. God moves. So imagine what an awesome win for him when he gets you to stop praying. Or all you ever do is pray over your food. And some of us don't even do that. Why? Because I don't think we get it. The prayers of God's people are powerful. Mary, Queen of Scots, uh, she was afraid of John Knox. Because he uh, opposed her religion. He opposed some of the things that she was doing. And so he was known as a man of faith and a man of prayer. And so he would, he would pray. And she was afraid of that. She made a statement, I fear the prayers of John Knox more than all the assembled armies of Europe. <laughs> Why? Because he was a godly man. And though she was not a believing person, she understood the power of the prayers of a believing person. The enemy knows the power. God is good. God. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, okay, look at verse uh, 10. Verse 10, Daniel chapter 10. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you and stand up, for I have now sent you. And when he said to me, I stood up trembling. Then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princesses, came to help me. Because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future. For the vision concerns a time yet to come. While he was saying this to me, I bowed my face toward the ground and was speechless. Then the one who looked like a man touched my lips and I opened my mouth and began to speak. I said to the one standing before him, I am overcome with anguish because of the vision, my Lord, and I feel very weak. How can I, your servant, talk with you, my Lord? My strength is gone, and I can hardly breathe. Again, the one who looked like a man touched me and gave me strength. Do not be afraid, you who are highly esteemed. He said, Peace, be strong now, be strong. And when he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Speak, my Lord, since you have given me strength. So he said, You do not know why I have come to you. Soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go, the prince of Greece will come. But first, I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one supports me against them except Michael, your prince. Okay, this gets really bizarre here. What, what, what is going on? So we have, have the man that's dressed in linen with a lightning face that, that I believe is a pre-incarnate Christ, in my understanding and estimation. And now God is speaking to Daniel to say, first of all, from the minute you started praying, we heard you. And we've noticed, you pray. God notices, we always talk about God noticing when, I, when we sin. God notices when we do right things, too. <laughs> we do things, acts of righteousness. He notices and he blesses us for those. And so Daniel is praying. And what's interesting, God doesn't change Daniel's situation. He's still in exile, so to speak, even though things have lessened for him. He didn't change his circumstances, but he sent him a messenger with a message. And the first message was, you are highly esteemed, Daniel. God loves you. God recognizes you. You are precious in his sight. This is where we need to start on our own identity. You are a holy creation of God in Christ. You are highly esteemed in the eyes of the Father. Now, out of that, we should live lives of righteousness, not lives of sin, but we are holy and precious in his sight because of Jesus Christ. So that should encourage us to face whatever battle we are in, to remember that the Lord is on our side. He is fighting the battles for us. And so with that understanding, he begins to explain to Daniel. Again, the lightning is associated with the presence of God. So he has this person who comes and touches him. He falls to the ground. He says, get up. He stands up. So who is this person? We're not quite sure who this is. Um, so Daniel, he's seeking to understand the prophecies. He's seeking to understand what's going on and what's going on in the times. And God again reminds him of the past, and God shows up and speaks to him. 
with this image and then another image, which is an angel, an angel of God who comes to speak to him. Because nothing God reveals is unimportant. Everything he says to you, everything he says to me through his word, and through personal experience, through our prayer time, none of this is unimportant. And part of it is to help us to face an uncertain future because we can't, you and I will crumble at an uncertain future if we are not convinced that God is in control. If we are, if we believe there's no plan, there's no sovereignty, and we're kind of up to figure out our own stuff, then we're not going to make that. But to realize that God is in control. So this is a horrifying moment for Daniel. I don't know if you ever considered the writers of Scripture, those who wrote the letters and wrote the story, the books that we, the 66 books that we have in our Bible, what they went through to write God-ordained Scripture. Daniel, through this experience, and the exile, Ezekiel, what he went through, the apostles, Paul, John, Peter, what they went through to write, what what led them to write this stuff, the experiences they had, the, the horror of it. I think if we just stop a minute and imagine what their life was like and what they had to go through to be used by God in this way so we can have the scripture we have today, we might hold this book in higher esteem than we do sometimes. And this is where we see Daniel with his revelation. And the revelation we'll look at in the next few weeks in chapters 11 and chapter 12. The revelations are for what are known as the silent years. In your Bible, between the Old Testament and New Testament, there's usually a blank page separating the Old Testament and New Testament. Mine on the cover says New Testament, revealing to me that the New Testament starts right there. So that little page in the middle of your Bible actually represents 400 years of silence. 400 years that the people of God did not hear from God. No sign, no wonder, no miracle, no revelation, no word, no scripture, nothing. It was silent. What this angel is about to prophesy to Daniel involves those 400 years. And it's not good. Again, we'll talk about that in chapter 11 and 12, but it's, it's enough to scare Daniel to death of what's going to happen. That's why God tried to prepare him before he began to share this with him. And so we, we see this revelation in this guy refers to Michael. So Michael is an archangel. So we have four angels basically identified by name in Scripture. Michael is one of those. He's listed two times here in Daniel, two times in the New Testament. He is an archangel. So there's, there's rank among the angel armies. And so Gabriel is one. I believe this is probably Gabriel that is here interacting with Daniel as he mentions Michael because Daniel was delayed for 21 days as he fought against the prince of Persia. Okay, that's interesting. And he talks about later the, the prince of Greece will come. Now, there's great debate over who these people are. I think this is another glimpse into the unseen realm that we have. One conclusion is these are humans that are military leaders, princes of these nations, fighting against Gabriel and Michael. So Michael comes. Michael is the angel that is in charge of the, the Lord's army. Okay, so he is the highest ranking angel. And so he comes and intercedes with this other angel in this battle against the king of Persia, which some believe is a human being. So we've seen throughout scripture that, that humans can be possessed by demons, that, that the evil one can use human people to inflict pain and oppression on God's people. Uh, we see this even with Job where Satan said, I, the only reason Job serves you, serves you is because you've given him everything. Let me take this stuff away. And God said, go ahead. So we see Satan opposing and oppressing even Job. So we see this spiritual battle that we have going on. Some believe that these are heavenly demonic angels, the king of Persia and the king of Greece. And that's why you see this angelic battle between good and evil. Because this angel was delayed for 21 days, which is interesting, that there was some kind of force of evil that could keep one of God's angels from carrying out his mission for 21 days until they brought in the leader of the troops. 
to help rescue this angel so he could be free to go and deliver the revelation as was intended. So again, I think here we see a glimpse into the unseen realm of the battle. I think if God were to peel back the heavens and we could see the battle that rages today for the souls of men and women, we would be overwhelmed by it. But if we could see the impact of our prayers on it, we would all be prayer warriors. We would increase our prayer life to see the significance of our prayers in this spiritual battle that takes place in realms we cannot see. I believe this is part of that revelation for Daniel. And he starts it off with a wonderful thing, telling Daniel that you are highly desired by God. You can imagine how encouraging that was. If he breaks over the sins of his people and God says, listen, dude, I love you. <laughs> I, I desire you. Do you realize you are desired by God? This is why he sent Jesus, right? He desires a relationship. You are desired by God, the creator of the universe, the victorious one over all that is evil, desires a relationship with you. This is what he says to Daniel. I don't know about you, but that gives me strength to fight the battles. It gives me encouragement to, to pray, to pray in the spirit. Pray boldly. Realize it has an impact. Daniel was passionate about God's glory. Again, do you grieve when God is ignored? Do you have a passion for the glory of God? Do you desire to see, to seek, to promote the glory of God? He prayed intensely for three weeks. And God answered his prayer in this wild way with his visitor. So the challenge I have for us this week, I don't know where you are in your prayer life. Hopefully it's growing. You're spending more time in the Word and more time in prayer. But I want to challenge you in this. For the next seven days, I want to challenge you to pray the Lord's Prayer. Not just as a rote, not as just something to memorize. Not just pray it, think about it. Process it. What, what, is, what are you being led to pray? Matthew 6, 9 through 13, we have the Lord's Prayer. Think about each line, about each statement. Spend time praying through it, but, but meditating on it. Why, why is this a part of that prayer that the Lord... And, and this is not the only way we pray, obviously. But there's significance in each step and the strategy of the Lord's Prayer. As he teaches us to pray in a deeper way. You take that challenge? Pretty easy one. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the fact that we can have a conversation with you. That we can speak to you and you speak back. That's amazing. And like Daniel, that you show up. You are a present God. Some of us just need to be reminded of that. All we can see are hungry lions around us, ready to devour. All we see is the enemy. All we see is the oppression. And we forget that you are God. God, may you strengthen your church. May you start here at First Burleson, empowering us, strengthening us to fight the battle, to, to let others know that there is a battle for their very soul, and there's only one way to be victorious, and that is in relationship with Jesus Christ, the one who desires them. We don't have the promise of tomorrow. You could come back today. Lord, help us not to delay, to share with those you've placed on our heart. And it starts with grieving over those who do not know you. We all know someone who at this point has rejected you, chosen not to believe in you. Help us not to be afraid to hound them with the truth. In love, of course, but to, to let them know that you love them and you can save them and rescue them now and for all of eternity. I pray in these next few moments, Lord, that you would save people, that you would rescue people from their sin. Holy Spirit, that you would rain down on this place and those watching, wherever they are, that they would feel a mighty presence, just like Daniel. A vision would be awesome too, but just to know that you are present and you are calling them into relationship. And if they will believe on Jesus Christ, they will be rescued from their sin. 
I ask that that would happen right now in Jesus' name. Well, the pastor wants us to continue uh, his response. Couldn't help but think about uh, the passage of Scripture in Philippians where Paul is telling the believers there that uh, God was able to do this. He said, and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. As Ronnie was preaching, I couldn't help but think of the fact that First, it begins with a need, right? We, have to, we, we, we confess a need to him. And it's wonderful to know that my needs are directly related to his supply. The greater my needs, the greater his supply. So we want to just take some time right now. If you'll bow your head, close your eyes. We want to, to uh, find out if there's some needs in our congregation this morning. If you have a need need for prayer, need for support. I want you to raise your hand. Daniel's here with me to help us. Don's with me here. Yes, I see those hands. Yes, I see those hands. Yes, I see those hands. In the balcony. Yes, I see a hand in the balcony. Thank you. Any other hands? I have a need. Uh, yes, thank you so much. I have a need. Yes, I see that hand. I have a need. Yes, I see that hand. Yes, I, I have a need. And my need is directly related to to God's supply. Someone comes to me, uh, my supply is going to run out. I see that hand. My supply is going to run out. Guess what? His supply is never going to run out. He is able, just as he was to Daniel. He is able to do all of our needs out of the riches of Christ Jesus. Any other hand? I'm going to ask Daniel to pray for us. Don's here in case you need to talk after the service today. He's here late. Daniel leads to prayer, please. Father, we acknowledge that you are a good Father, and that your supply does not run out, that we cannot bring a need that you cannot supply, that you are all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present, and that alone, God, brings comfort to our souls and our minds. I'm going to pray as we bring needs to you across the room remind us of your presence first and foremost even more so than the supply we want you so then God we thank you for the supply thank you for who you are that you've been consistent since the beginning of time will be consistent forevermore and Father I pray that you will meet uh, the needs across this room the people who are crying out to you your people as we jump into this with peace patience wisdom, relational reconciliation, answers when there seem to be none, God, health, all the above, and we give you the glory ahead of time, we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. You know, faith is only as good as its object, and the object of my faith is the Lord Jesus. I need no other argument, I need no other plea, it is enough that Jesus died. And that he died for you. Let's sing this wonderful song together. Stand, please. My faith has found a resting place. My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor greed. I trust the ever living one, his wounds for me shall bleed. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Enough for me that Jesus saves. This ends my fear and doubt. A sinful soul, I come to him. I'll never cast me out. I need no That he died for me. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.